Vada, we're good to start? Yep, okay. And this is the mic here. All right, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our third volume of the Learn and Discuss event. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Tropical Agri-Sciences for hosting us here today and supportive of our last few um, Learn and Discuss, but also other events that we've had. Um, as well as my other student ambassadors. So you see them around the room. We're not wearing our shirts today, but um, yep, there's lots of us around here. And especially Bada for putting this together and just conceiving the idea, which I think we're all quite happy that we're here today. Um, all right, to get into it right away. Uh, so due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this is why we're here today, so that we can learn about one of the impacts of the war. Uh, we have three experts here with us, and they're all from our faculty, which is quite impressive. And they will elaborate on different aspects concerning global food security and the impacts that the war has on it. Um, so to start, is our agenda here. So starting with Dr. Olga Leuner, um, this is the topic, to the first one to go. Then we have Associate Professor Tinek Robik, and then we might have a five minutes break, depending on how you guys are feeling. Then uh, we have Professor Jan Banu, and then finally a discussion, but there will be five minutes or so after each presenter, so you can definitely ask Ben, or if you want to save it for the final discussion, of course. Then there'll be a small snack in our fancy cafe room um, uh, through Be Fair. They were the ones that are putting that together, and uh, some networking. And then finally, if you feel like still networking and talking, you can head out to uh, Club C as well. All right, so I will hand it over. Uh, oh, quickly, some housekeeping. Just turn off your phone, please. We are recording this, um, and there'll be lots of times after the presentation to discuss amongst yourselves. So maybe just give, your, give the presenters your full attention. And uh, the toilets, you can just go out through the back door, and they're right outside the door there. All right. And here's your paper. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, yeah, finally presenting, uh, we have Dr. Olga Lerner, and she's at the Faculty of Tropical Agrosciences, it's Department of Tropical Crops and Agroforestry. Um, she's a fo food processing expert and teaching a course on cereals and pulses. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, and thank you for inviting me here today. And uh, now I would like to, uh, within this uh, within this third uh, event of Learn and Discuss, I would like to bring my contribution uh, to uh, possible like possible impacts of the war uh, on global food security. And I would like to focus on basically grains, especially wheat and uh, and corn. Uh, and other uh, crops that were an important export product of the Ukraine. Uh, so first, Ukraine uh, is called a granary of Europe, or at least we, we say this. And <coughs> uh, I will uh, later a few slides about that. But uh, first I would like to ask you to maybe even close your eyes, but like in your minds, go back uh, to, to the end of February this year, like 20, let's say, 2nd, 4th. Uh, and uh, if you can remember, uh, what did you expect this year, these years to come to bring you? Uh, maybe we, will, we have expected a uh, quick recovery from this COVID era, right? And uh, if I ask you at the time, uh, you know, we will have this uh, learn and discuss, I and mean, what topic would you pick? You would maybe say, well, how the, uh, uh, in, what's the impact of COVID on agriculture, let's say. And, well, here we are, just a few weeks after, with totally different uh, topic, quite surprising topic, because I think that even uh, whatever politicians, uh, journalists, experts, uh, you know, Whoever, they, like, there were really like, just few people who really did expect the war uh, that the war would come. And now we have to revise 
what would our, what are our expectations, what, what is really going to happen, what are our prognoses. And in order to be able to do so, we need to get uh, some real facts. Uh, what the Ukraine meant for uh, global food security in means of its uh, contribution to the uh, world market with, uh, with grains. So now, uh, wishing for facts, I would like to tell you something about what Ukraine, um, what was the Ukraine, Ukrainian contribution. Well, uh, Ukraine used to be a part of uh, the Union of, of Social, uh, no, the Soviet Socialistic Republic. And although uh, it was just a really tiny part, just 3% as to the, uh, the land, it was really important as to the agricultural production. Uh, so you see that it would produce 25% of all the agricultural commodities. And so it was like uh, more than half of uh, sugar beet and corn, about half of sunflower seeds, uh, and like a uh, quarter of potato, wheat, uh, milk and dairy, meat, and eggs. Uh, so although tiny, it had a big impact on the overall uh, supply of food and agricultural commodities uh, in that uh, union of countries. Yeah? And uh, after that, when this union mm, broke and uh, Ukraine uh, got its uh, independence, it went through some, like, not really very specified, but you could say kind of phases. So 10 years after, uh, they uh, experienced a dramatic drop of agricultural production. You know, they, uh, uh, they were in this point that they had to really change considerably the way uh, they, they did agriculture. And uh, like between 2000 and 2010, uh, they uh, enter the active development stage where they shift shifted from produce as much as possible to the produce as efficiently as possible. So they try to introduce uh, high quality seeds and, uh, and uh, crop protection products and also um, fertilizers, uh, modern technology, machinery and equipment in order to, uh, to use uh, the natural resources that they had efficiently. Uh, and then, uh, from since uh, 2010, there is uh, like another era, innovative solutions applying stage. You know, these terms are actually, I, and all these information I took from this kind of brochure or let's say report, which is which was infographic report published uh, to celebrate the 30 years of Ukrainian independence, and they provide really nice data. If you you can like I can send you this uh, publication or you can find it online. And uh, so they claim they that now uh, they uh, try not only to produce as efficiently as possible, but also uh, as, um, let's say, you know, go towards sustainability uh, and pay attention to climate change, uh, price conditions on the world market, demand for products, you know, to, uh, to be uh, efficient and also uh, kind of sustainable. Ukraine has got this uh, this like unique uh, feature that there is a lot of land uh, with uh, so-called Chernozem. Uh, this one is the um, major uh, part, but also here uh, in this region there is a lot of a uh, lot of high quality uh, soil uh, that's very productive. And uh, here uh, this is again a map of Ukraine showing where uh, the, these are two examples of uh, grain and leguminous crops and oilseed, where they are uh, produced. So uh, most of grain and leguminous crops would be produced here in this like uh, northeast and here central, like central tribe of Ukraine. So these are the regions where, which are um, the regions for cultivation of uh, of uh, grains and seeds. And uh, I hope you can imagine the, the map of Ukraine, uh, how it looks now uh, with uh, the 
regions that are now invaded by uh, uh, Russian troops, and you see that a uh, lot of regions overlap with the uh, with the uh, invasion. Uh, so, what actually brings Ukraine on the uh, world market? So, Ukraine is number one in sunflower seed production, and of course, this is associated with the sunflower seed meal, uh, the, uh, the press cake. And it's not only that they have like more, a few more percent than others. They really do have over. Oops, sorry. They really do have over 50% of the uh, of the market uh, of uh, sunflower oil. So they are top. And then uh, they are number three in rapeseed and corn. So these data is for 2020. Uh, you know, now uh, I looked it up, and they seem to be uh, number four for corn at the moment, uh, and number two for rapes. But uh, but you know, this is not a big deal. It's uh, they are always uh, quite high uh, in the um, top, and they are great producer of barley, and then rye, sorghum, uh, sunflower seed, wheat. Yeah, you know, it's like. Uh, in all these uh, commodities, they are uh, um, the worst is the number ten in the world. So obviously, this is enormous amount of uh, raw uh, agriculture produce uh, that uh, is in majority uh, transformed into our food. Well, uh, now there is a war. So they will not be able to produce everything uh, they did before and everything they wanted to uh, produce this year. So the uh, key Ukraine, is, uh, Ukraine products, it, uh, you, you know, I like hint, read where could we be in trouble? So which commodities uh, could be threatened by the war? Uh, so it's corn, sunflower seed, wheat, rapeseed, barley, the press cake from uh, sunflower um, pressing, uh, seed oil and uh, um, and soybean, and these are in the order of the price that these commodities brought to the uh, Ukrainian national budget. So, in order of importance, of importance, and these uh, actually put together uh, over uh, like three quarters of Ukrainian export. And if I go them uh, one by one, uh, so these are countries where Ukraine uh, was uh, exporting these products. So corn went uh, mostly to, uh, well, the red countries are countries of Asia. Uh, these kind of um, Genta countries are uh, European and uh, yellow is, uh, stands for, uh, for Africa. They see that uh, majority of, uh, of corn went to China, but you know, actually, it's quite well distributed, and if you uh, if you look uh, to the numbers, it's not that uh, one single country uh, would buy as much uh, corn from Ukraine, uh, you know, to feel threatened now, like severely. Uh, in some flower seeds, you see that I'm afraid that Bulgaria is going to have uh, difficulties. They will have to find another source of their uh, sunflower seeds because the vast majority on, of sunflower seeds went, uh, came from Ukraine. Uh, now, uh, with wheat, it, it's uh, starting to be quite interesting because uh, there are uh, countries like India, Pakistan, well, you know, these major large countries, they can produce uh, some um, wheat on their own, uh, not, not enough, to cover their needs, but they also have some neighbors and other countries where they could f um, find possibly uh, wheat, like China or Australia. But then there are countries of, uh, of Northern Africa, like Egypt, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia. These countries, they don't have the land to grow their own wheat. No, they, they uh, have partially um, uh, desert on their um, area, so they can't really grow so much of wheat, and they will really have uh, difficulties finding alternative uh, sources of wheat for their uh, market. Uh, well, then we've got uh, rapeseed, uh, basically um, all the rapeseed from uh, 
Ukraine went to uh, went to Europe, but Europe on its own is a um, great producer of rapeseed. So I believe uh, that this will uh, this will be uh, balanced. Uh, barley went uh, mostly to to China and other uh, Asian countries, as well as in uh, as to uh, to uh, Africa. Then uh, seed oil, it's again it's quite well distributed into some large countries and the European countries that cooperate closely together. So I don't think that uh, they will be some like um, really threatened that they will there will be a lack of uh, of these um, products on the market. Uh, and soybean, uh, well here that's a, that's a really big question because uh, soybean from uh, Ukraine went to you know, countries like Belarus, uh, Turkey, and they will really have to search for alternative uh, sources. So uh, the, the um, countries where Ukraine exported their produce were basically European Union, China, India, Egypt, Turkey. These were the uh, like over 60% of the agriculture produce went uh, to uh, these uh, five uh, territories. Uh, what I uh, hope and expect that these three, uh, European Union, China, and India, will somehow uh, manage because the, they are rich territories and uh, well, of course it will have uh, an influence on the price but it won't uh, I don't think that it will be it will cause uh, some problems of food but we've got these two countries like Egypt and Turkey and they might uh, fi face um, problems because it's not only uh, the uh, the commodities but it's also that they process them and export further. Uh, so in Egypt, uh, you know, this uh, red color represents Russia, Russia, Russian produce, and this, of course, it's Ukraine. So majority of wheat uh, going to Egypt is from these two countries. Uh, and it will be a big question whether uh, Russia will be able uh, to uh, fulfill its um, agreement of uh, um, um, wheat supplies because at the moment uh, I think they also regulate the market with agriculture produce. Uh, then Turkey. Uh, so ma again, majority of Turkey uh, of wheat in Turkey comes from Russia and Ukraine, but it's not the end of the story because uh, the um, Turkey they process a lot of wheat into wheat flour which they then further sell to countries like Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Angola, you know, and many African countries. So uh, obviously if Turkey has a leg of wheat, they will want to keep their wheat from, them, from, from their own country. And, uh, and it's like butterfly effect. Uh, these uh, for these um, other countries will have uh, difficulties as well. Uh, well, uh, here also Lebanon, uh, they have a lot of wheat from Russia and Ukraine, plus also 42% for, uh, of soybean and 26% uh, of corn uh, from Ukraine. And if all these will uh, you know, drop off, I think they, they will early face um, problems because it's n uh, not only uh, that, um, uh, well, because the commodities will, of course, have much higher uh, prices. And also Yemen will very probably face uh, problems oh, sorry. Uh, because uh, it's not only the, uh, the wheat, but also 94% of wheat flour uh, comes from Turkey and Egypt into Yemen. And you see both these countries are named here as uh, those that, uh, that buy a lot of wheat from, uh, from Ukraine. And uh, also Ethiopia, a country that actually uh, can grow partially some wheat on its own, but the consumption, generally the consumption of wheat in, and wheat flour in Africa is still increasing. And uh, they very often import both wheat and wheat flowers and Ethiopia uh, have 20% uh, over 20% of wheat from Egypt again uh, threatened by uh, by uh, war. 
And what about Czech Republic? You know, we are in the Czech Republic, so we should be, uh, we should also focus on our country and try to estimate the impact. Uh, the um, Czech Republic is not uh, some exceptional uh, trade partner uh, of Ukraine within the EU countries. There are other countries, more important uh, part partners for the agrarian uh, trade with Ukraine. Uh, to the Czech Republic, uh, what, was, what was brought, what was uh, imported from Ukraine? It was ethanol, fruits, nuts, poultry, sunflower oil and, uh, and honey. Uh, basically all these uh, uh, can be uh, found on other markets. Uh, and I don't think that we, were, we are going to face a lack of whatever product. Uh, different question is the price. When, you know, uh, Czech Republic is uh, an exporter of wheat, for example, and, uh, but it doesn't mean that the Czech farmers have to sell uh, its wheat to Czech producers, to Czech mills. They can sell it to anybody who comes and pays good price. So obviously it will have uh, impact on the price, but probably not on the, on the food supplies. So what we are going to miss? We are going to miss the worker, the people. Because our agriculture, uh, especially the seasonal, uh, seasonal works, were very much based on the um, people coming here from Ukraine working on our fields, harvesting our crops. I think this, is, uh, this will be a major difficulty. And then, uh, are there any alternatives? So where other countries are going to get, uh, get their um, wheat uh, and corn and soybean and sunflower oil? Well, that's a big question. And this is maybe the place, uh, the space for, for discussion. I think that, uh, the countries that are not influenced, uh, influenced uh, by war will maybe a little bit revise their population cycles and will uh, pay more attention to uh, some cash crops. I can imagine that uh, from like New World, from uh, America, they, there could come a little bit more uh, grains to Africa, to especially the northern part, uh, the countries from Asia that uh, got um, grains from Ukraine could maybe find uh, some more grains in, in China or in, in Australia. Oh, who knows? But there's another aspect that I wanted to um, I wanted you to pay attention to, which is the uh, which is the food World Food Program. And uh, the problem of World Food Program is that uh, they buy uh, they buy cereals, grains, they make them into food, and then they uh, supply this food. Uh, to countries that are quite poor to, you know, um, as a um, like humanitarian aid. And if uh, the food and the grain, uh, grain's price are going up, of course, it would mean that the World Food Program will have to, uh, will be able only to feed less people. That's also a, another uh, side effect of the war. And uh, so the um, the Ukrainian grain harvest in 2021 was overall 84 million uh, ton. Yeah? And out of it, it was like one, let's say one third uh, was the wheat. And out of these 84 million, uh, of, million of tons, they uh, exported the majority. And <coughs> it means that the domestic uh, consumption was like, let's say, 20 or not even 20 million of tons of grain out of it, uh, 7.4 million of uh, tons of wheat. And this is a fact from last year. And uh, this year, uh, it's uh, the first estimate from uh, Ukrainian government is that, for example, the spring crops, uh, the harvest of spring crops could be halved. And uh, so I found another data on the estimates how the war uh, will influence uh, the harvest of this year. So last year they would, uh, uh, in spring crops, they had 15 million of hectares. This year, probably half. For the winter crops, uh, it was uh, over uh, 6 million hectares last year, and they expect 4 million this, 4 million this year. Well, if there was uh, uh, 
good harvest, like four tons, let's say, per hectare uh, from these uh, four million, oops, million hectares till they could uh, get at least enough grain to feed their domestic needs. But of course, there are no, uh, no leftovers to be uh, exported. And uh, there are some facts beyond uh, the outage of Ukraine uh, production. <clears throat> thanks to, or well, thanks, uh, due to the uh, due to the ban of uh, of trade with Russia, we will also have the outage of Ukraine uh, of Russian products. And then uh, many fields, and it's you know here and there you you already hear some news that the fields are being not only damaged and uh, contaminated, but they are also being booby trapped. Uh, even before this war, Ukraine was uh, was the lead uh, country in mine casualties, and this was like uh, 2016 already. So now, if the if there are mines, if the field would change into minefields, then of course it will be even worse. And of, and uh, of course, the agriculture machinery will be damaged, and people have little bit different things to do than uh, to you know, cultivate their land. Although the president of Ukraine, they, he realizes the problem, and he encouraged uh, the farmers to uh, to cultivate the land. But well, let's see uh, whether uh, and how much they could earn. Uh, okay, so this was my last slide. I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to my uh, colleagues uh, to uh, bring their uh, views. Thank you. And if we have any pressing questions or um, right. anybody about the discussion, we do have one from online. Uh, would there be any possibilities uh, for the workforce from other countries, perhaps? Um, meaning, you had talked about the Ukrainian workers. Would there be a possibility of having other workers uh, for this time being? Well, I think so, because uh, our government, uh, they uh, facilitated a little bit, the, or they made uh, the visa process easier for mm -hmm. the Ukrainian worker to work here. So I think that if the government applied this kind of measures for other nationalities too, yep. uh, we could attract some uh, other, um, other nationalities yep. for the uh, seasonal work. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. All right. Okay. Maybe, maybe I have one. Mm -hmm. So, well, like the problem or like the main issue, as you uh, stated, the Czech Republic is that the seasonal workers won't be able to be here, right? But, and now you said, that the government is facilitating the visa processes for different nationalities to be able to come and work. But wouldn't it like, be good, since Czech Republic has right now a large share of the refugees from the war, like, to offer these jobs to them? Yes, but imagine, you know, these are not... Uh, the, the people who would come to do the seasonal work, they did it kind of voluntarily. Okay. And they were, you know, I don't know what were the professions. But uh, you must imagine that these uh, refugees, they are, you know, doctors, librarians, uh, cooks, and, uh, you know, we don't want to force them to do things that they, uh, they don't want. Uh, I mean, yes, we can offer them the option, but we can't somehow, you know, manipulate them into, uh, into works that they, they, they don't know, they don't want to do. Uh, this is, I think we have to be cautious with that. Uh, but offer, yes, we can do it. We can do it. We can offer. Thank you. And also, a lot of people who came here from Ukraine, there with kids. So, uh, and the field work um, is mostly from early morning till dark evening. Mm -hmm. And if you have a kid or two kids, it's difficult to work you know, in that condition. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, one more. So, uh, you spoke about uh, the European countries, but I uh, watched uh, reports uh, from Germany that uh, there have been like uh, the people attacked the supermarkets and they bought uh, the only sunflower uh, oil and the, uh, the, the flour also. So, it's hard to find the, the, these products like a problem in, in the society. Would, would, would that happen? I mean, in the, the community which are here in Czech Republic? 
Well, I hope not. I, I saw it uh, uh, also uh, in the time of coronavirus, where uh, there was uh, like people were afraid they could be a lack of this and that in in the stores. At the end of the day, it was all okay. There was there was there's never there was never really a uh, shortage of anything. But I uh, remember watching some uh, news from Germany that people were buying like loads of toilet papers in order to, maybe Germany somehow uh, is more uh, sensitive to uh, to <laughs> you know to uh, how to say it <clears throat> have all the supplies uh, and uh, yeah. I, I don't think that this is I don't really expect that we will have a shortage of anything I mean if we don't have uh, sunflower oil we will use uh, rapeseed oil or Different oil. There will be enough oil on the planet. I hope, I believe. Right. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Yeah. Maybe regarding the agricultural machinery, in my opinion, the bigger issue is the precision strikes against the food depots because uh, you can have all the agricultural machinery available, but uh, without fuel, it won't move. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's correct. Maybe I should have added this. And I was just thinking, what what will be like beyond the uh, the, the shortage in production? What will be uh, the problem? Yeah, this is another uh, point that uh, could be here as well. Yeah, here. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. And there's water here for you too. Oh yeah. If you want. Okay. You got some. Okay. Henrik, here you Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, yeah. And just another Thank you. housekeeping. Uh, if you guys could just pull into the middle a little bit, we have lots of people coming in, and so they can just quietly sneak in. Maybe move one or two seats over to the middle, please. And this is our um, live stream mic, so if you want to walk around, you can also hold it. Or I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. If I can have your attention again, please. Uh, next up, we have Associate Professor Hinek Robik, who's also at our Faculty of Tropical Agrosciences, uh, the Department of Sustainable Technologies. He's coordinated several projects in Ukraine, uh, including the strengthening scientific capacities and cooperation of Ukrainian universities in the agrosciences, the international credit mobility cooperation between Czech Republic and Ukraine, and the inter-university cooperation as a tool for enhancement of quality of selected universities in Ukraine. Um, in addition, he's also the head of the biogas team and many additional projects in Southeast Asia and Africa. So thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so as was nicely introduced, my name is Inek Roby. And I will be following up what uh, my colleague Olga uh, already told you. She gave you a good view of what was happening and what it might mean. Might mean. And I will look also what is happening right now. Uh, I named it War in Ukraine because that was the name of the of the Laren discuss, I think. But uh, more should be uh, effects of Russian invasion uh, and its impact on global security. But uh, couple of things to, uh, to put in, in context. Of course, we have uh, millions of people who are on the move. We have millions of people who are in endangered by uh, endangered in terms of food security in Ukraine itself, apart from the other countries, especially in the tropical regions in the global south. Uh, in um, FAO recently looked at the uh, uh, majority of the or all the regions or oblasts as it is called in, in Ukraine and in almost all of them there is quite high uncertainty about harvesting the crops, planting the new crops and uh, also sustaining the, the livestock production. Uh, that's also uh, we need because 
all of these issues are very, very complex. Yeah? If you are having uh, a lack of, uh, uh, lack of feeding for animals, you, you cannot really feed the animals. So a lot of uh, animal houses, uh, livestock houses, uh, the, the animals, they had to be slaughtered because they didn't have enough to, uh, to keep them, to feed them. Um, in some regions, yeah, that, that was, was done in, very, in a way that they were uh, for free, maybe giving it to the neighbors or people in the cities and so on. We know about these reports, but what will happen later on, there will be a lot of issues to uh, get back to this livestock, uh, livestock uh, sizes and amounts of, of animals which were there in the past. Now, uh, we have, we are, we already are experiencing uh, food shortages in, in Ukraine, which are either already happening now or they will be coming in upcoming one, two or three months. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, I was re recently doing some podcast for, for uh, uh, our I don't know some university podcast, and there I was I was uh, put it, I was saying uh, uh, one quotation which I which I put it here as well because I think it it it's not about if the food crisis will come but it's it's about how big the food crisis it will be not only in Ukraine but also in in other regions. Now if we look uh, what what are the expectations uh, in terms of food shortages, and now we are looking into into Ukraine. So maybe in in a third third uh, uh, third country or among the third of the population, there there might be fine, uh, but let's say around third of the population they are already in uh, food shortages at the moment, and uh, another quarter uh, will be later in the year, another twelve percent within next couple of months. So you can see majority of the remaining population in Ukraine will be definitely uh, in risk unless uh, more uh, foreign aid will uh, will be able to uh, to support it. Uh, now also if, if we look uh, because it's not only about uh, uh, agriculture but it's also about accessing all other products necessarily for your living yeah? anything you you need today uh, here you just go as I saw their colleagues where they were just running to get something to the shop before they came to this lecture yeah. So uh, we have uh, quite, uh, or in Ukraine there is quite in majority in wholesale, in distribution, in retail, uh, there is uh, lack of maintaining of supplies, of it, uh, obviously. Uh, so uh, and that's uh, reducing the, the potential access to, to key food items and other items uh, for the population. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, Olga before me very nicely put it into context. I will I will build uh, upon that a bit uh, because there is also a question about uh, the availability and and accessibility really because if we uh, for example the paper grain there still might be there as Olga was saying there might be enough to feed the population but what about the accessibility for them? Yeah? If something is in the storage it doesn't mean that it will get to the consumer or to the user or to the, to the person who actually needs it. Um, now, there is at the moment, there are no significant issues with the staple crop availability, yeah? uh, but this will, be, this will be definitely changing. Uh, there is no issue at the moment because there are quite big supplies. Uh, also, uh, there was not necessarily problems for other countries because majority of plant export left already before the, the Russian invasion, uh, and the remaining uh, remaining uh, remaining amounts they were they were uh, embargoed or they were uh, they, they, there was a uh, decision to keep them in the country, uh, which there, it raised a lot of question. But in reality, it wasn't really a problem because it was not planned to be export anymore. And also, it was not possible to export it uh, because uh, a lot of the harbors and so on were, were, were taken. Uh, now, but what will be uh, quite a crucial problem will be the, the, the storage, uh, for example, of the staple grain. Because you need to think that uh, uh, you need to store it.
somewhere and you need to store it well and it's not something you will you will just decide okay this part is is being invaded so we'll store it somewhere else no you need to have facilities you need to have have it equipped for that you need to have some infrastructure and uh, uh, around half half of, of all the available heat was stored in the in the areas where uh, where fighting is uh, where fighting is happening and taking place. Uh, so this will be also one of the crucial, quite crucial question: uh, what sort of mechanism to 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 put in place, uh, how to uh, maybe transport uh, and logistically transport the grain to the safe safe locations, and if there is uh, uh, the capacities there. Uh, now, of course, as uh, there was a qu raised question about the fuel, of course, uh, because when we are talking about agriculture production, and we are not talking, we are already talking yeah, about relatively modern machinized production, yeah? so you need to have fuel. And Ukraine, of course, is, is depending mainly on fuel uh, imported from, uh, from Russia and, and Belarus, majority of that. And this is creating one of the key bottlenecks for the for the spring spring uh, planting, as well as later on uh, later on for for harvesting, uh, because uh, uh, it is a critical critical factor. Uh, there is a lot of regions where even the the farmers they are really willing they want to uh, work on the field, but they simply cannot because they don't have the fuel and. The fuel is just not there. It's not something you can uh, you can uh, make out of nothing. Yeah? And uh, around uh, uh, <clears throat> around uh, one fifth of uh, all the key agribusinesses in in Ukraine at the moment uh, is having sufficiently fuel to to start planting. Yeah? One fifth of them. So if we will think about a part of availability of fields and that uh, the, the fields are there and we think that maybe some of the fields are not mined but then we are getting into the problem that there is just not fuel to to do the work yeah? and fields in Ukraine they are massive it's 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 a huge agricultural country the, the fields are uh, very big the agribusinesses are very big so uh, you don't have other options than have uh, machinery and you need fuel for that. Uh, also, of course, you need seeds. Uh, uh, majority of, of the farmers, they still have seeds from, uh, from uh, previous uh, times, so uh, more than half of them have sufficient amount of seeds to more or less plant. Uh, but then it will get us also to the, uh, to the fertilizers, where already a small number of, of farmers are having uh, sufficient amount of fertilizers they are still having from uh, from the uh, previous uh, previous time so because they plan you plan when you are working in agriculture you plan quite in advance yeah? so you don't just buy it on the last moment usually you have storages and so on uh, but then uh, things which you which you usually buy with not uh, uh, which you buy maybe within a couple of weeks or months before before uh, planting or harvesting are pesticides, and uh, uh, only one fourth of the farmers are are having uh, having them. And then uh, equipment, yes, yeah, some of some of the equipment was lost, some of the equipment was destroyed, or well destroyed. Uh, so that's another another large problem there. Uh, of course, yeah, there is series of risks associated with the land preparation. Uh, there are reports, quite a lot of reports, of unexploded mines, military cas casualties, uh, unburied, uh, unburied uh, bodies in the field, which, which, is, uh, which is creation uh, potential, uh, potential um, uh, like, uh, um, what's the word? Well, ruining, ruining the area, let's say. Uh, then, of course, humanitarian access is quite constrained, logistic constraints, lack of drivers, lack of, uh, that's also quite crucial, yeah? because you have the farmers, but a lot of them are 
a uh, lot of the field workers or the workers, yeah, they they cannot just go from the front yeah, because a lot of them are now uh, fighting and defending their country. So they cannot just throw the gun and go to drive the drive all the tractors and machinery which is which is needed. So uh, the same thing, which yeah, as all goes saying, we will be missing a lot of agricultural workers here. Uh, but in Ukraine, it is even a bigger problem because the people they are in the country, but they cannot just switch what they are doing and and, and get back to the, uh, to the agriculture. Uh, so it's quite quite a series uh, series of issues. And in the end, it also gets me, uh, as I was mentioning, fertilizers several times uh, to the issue of fertilizers, which is also a quite significant problem, uh, which gets me from Ukraine to the bridge to the whole world, more or less. Uh, uh, because fertilizers and their, their shortage is growing concern, not only in Ukraine, but all around the world, even here. Uh, even uh, uh, here, the, the prices get uh, twice as high, or in some cases, triple, tripled, uh, tripled uh, to, to, compared to the to the fertilizer prices last year. Uh, imagine that uh, you would go to buy something which yesterday was costing you ten crowns, and and today it costs you thirty crowns. That's a quite a huge difference, and. Uh, of course, combined Russia and Belarus, they are providing about 40% of world's exports of potash. Uh, some of the exports here, Russian exports, they are being hit by sanctions, but also Russia themselves, they are uh, strategically uh, reducing some of the some of the exports because they uh, realize how, how important the fertilizers are. Uh, then, uh, of, then we have Belarus, which is an uh, ally of, of of, uh, of Russia, who are going probably in the same, uh, creating also or supporting this stressful uh, this stress in in in, in the in the uh, fertilizers market. And uh, now then, if we if we go if you look at Russia and Ukraine, they together export around more than quarter of fertilizers made from nitrogen and phosphorus as well as potassium. So it's quite big amounts which go. Through the whole world, uh, they, 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 this is it's 28 percent. This is this is ex, the export to the world. Yeah, so it's not anything small. It's massive. Yeah? They always were a massive producers and massive exporters in terms of fertilizers. Uh, and this is what is it doing? This it is making skyrocketing the prices of fertilizers, and eventually now it's already showing in in prices of food, which Yes, here in Czech Republic, as I was saying, yeah, we will always be able to, the food will be here. Yeah? The European Union is, is strong in, uh, it has very strong purchasing power, so the food always will be here. But then what we are sort of doing in order to have it here for us, someone else eventually has to suffer because it doesn't just grow uh, grow somewhere randomly. Yeah? You cannot just, uh, uh, you have to take it from somewhere. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the important thing is that fertilizers are actually feeding the world. Yeah? They, they are, the nitrogen is essential part of everything. And as for, for us, yeah, the, 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 we need nutrients and, and minerals to be, to, to, as we need to eat, yeah, the, the plants are also simply food for the, uh, the fertilizers are sort of food for the crops. Uh, I just put here this, uh, uh, this recent statement of, of, uh, of this, this little guy uh, who in, it was just four or five days ago when he said there's a sort of shortage of fertilizers today and they will buy what they are short of. They will. No one wants to die of hunger. Uh, uh, and well, they, because they are producing a lot, they have also very, very big power in it. And it's very dangerous also in, uh, apart from all the other dangers we, we put, put in. Uh, and why, uh, why this is uh, quite important for us? Yeah? 
because for now more than a more than a century we are relying very much on fertilizers uh it is uh, at, at this moment large proportion of of uh, food production is thanks to the uh synthetic mineral fertilizers and we rely on them in terms of feeding the the world which is uh the population is is, is growing and uh the uh the fertilizers are supporting approximately 50 percent of the population that means every second of you is relying on the fertilizers uh here you can see uh the growth of the world population um, and here you can see uh, world population supported without fertilizers and world population fed by synthetic fertilizer yeah it's around 50 percent uh, it's a massive massive amount every second of you look at your your uh, partner next to you uh, one of you have to uh, have to go <laughs> Uh, so here you can here you can see it more uh, nicely visually yeah? that uh, uh, this is amount yeah, around now now it is over a little bit over four billion people who we are able to feed without fertilizers. Uh, now another implications uh, the, the the skyrocketing prices of fertilizers they are uh, they are putting pressure on farmers all around the world. Uh, and all the farmers, they, they are now thinking, OK, what, what will we do? Uh, apart from, for example, in Czech Republic, also uh, quite a uh, big rise in, 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 in prices of electricity. So a uh, couple of farmers here with, with, with whom I, I talked, uh, they, are, uh, they are stopping, for example, their production in greenhouses and in winter because they, it doesn't pay off anymore. A uh, lot of farmers all around the world, what they are doing, they have to choose from different strategies what they will uh, what they will do. Uh, some of the farmers they will or they will be applying less fertilizers, which will lead to the to the uh, smaller yields. Some of the farmers they will try to get back, especially those who, who have to to organic fertilizers. Some of the farmers uh, they do as a lot of people, especially in Europe and US, did already during the, the COVID crisis, as was mentioned, the toilet papers. Yeah, people, when they think it's, the crisis is coming, they will just, as there was left reports from Germany and US, that people bought a full garage of toilet paper. Yeah? Uh, some, of the, some of the farmers also did that, which they stockpiled a lot of fertilizers, uh, because they expect that the situation might be even worse. But once you do the stockpiling, you are endangering also the others. Yeah? Uh, some are switching to, to crops that require smaller amount of nutrients. Some just going to cultivate less, uh, less acreage, uh, smaller fields, and some will use less fertilizers. In any case, in the end, it will probably lead, well, almost uh, for sure, it will lead to the smaller yields in, in, in total. Uh, uh, and in the end, as uh, was also mentioned by my colleague before, the highest impact will be in the in the global south, uh, in the developing countries. Um, now, one other important player is China. China is geopolitical power, which raised quite into quite significant uh, amounts. And last year already they, they imposed fertilizer export curbs. Uh, uh, and it was expected that because they wanted to secure their, their farmers and it was expected that they will release those restrictions this year. But of course, in this situation, they probably will not. Uh, and they are, uh, uh, they are also quite big producer of the fertilizer. Even, uh, and then I even didn't touch the, uh, the issue of where the, uh, the, the uh, materials for the fertilizers are produce, which is another another issue. Now then some of the countries they will be in, a, in a, they will be able to because we have also the rising prices of natural gas. Uh, <clears throat> this will be also in fact impacting very differently different regions because for example uh, compared compared to uh, America producers and compared uh, compared for example uh, EU 
they have much lower because they are able to produce it themselves they, are, they have much lower uh, costs to produce it yeah? but in Europe uh, the prices will be much uh, much higher uh, because you have to also when you are creating you know fertilizer you need also natural gas for uh, for that uh, because the process is relatively uh, energy demanding now then we have another another one Belarus uh, um, there we have which is also a big player a big big player with a with a state-owned uh, uh, company producing fertilizers, uh, which is uh, it will it will depend how much they might be touched by the sanctions and how much they will uh, be strategizing in terms of reducing the exports or increasing the prices on the market of fertilizer. So uh, we are in the situation that with food prices on the rise and food shortages on the horizon and gas to become more scarce resource, especially for some regions. Uh, it will be important to, uh, to probably look for new types of fertilizers for the future, definitely, which is opening much more doors also for the researchers to, to work on it more intensively. Uh, because uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those are, uh, a lot of those are quite quite crucial yeah? and now what should be done uh, well that's that's hard to say right that's, that's really hard to say but uh, there's a couple of couple of things uh, so I didn't want to end on a really negative note yeah there is a couple of things what, what can be done more in the future uh, apart from uh, some of the countries will have to uh, push the fertilizers prices down some of the countries are already doing that uh, in order to make the food production affordable and food in the end affordable. Uh, also more towards responsible and efficient use of nitrogen fertilizers and uh, well, bigger, bigger focus on, on use of organic fertilizers. These sort of uh, challenges which are, which are created, they can always uh, create also a lot of opportunities. So as we are moving from uh, as there will be for sure a bigger push towards renewable energy sources, they will, there will have to be also a bigger push towards organic fertilizers and other sources of, of, uh, of uh, uh, fertilizing or, uh, for example, biological nitrogen fixation options and so on, uh, because the options are there, we'll just have to dig into it deeper. In any case, uh, yeah, as this Russian invasion, well, it is reminding us that we need to uh, also think more about the, 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 the future and challenge and address quite a lot of challenges in terms of hunger and food security challenges, while also ensuring better, uh, better and more resilient agriculture as well as uh, renewable energy sources for the future, uh, because as we experience already with, with COVID, now we experience with Russian invasion to Ukraine, and well, it's highly likely that, that more shocks will be coming in the future. So the resilience is probably the, the essential word to the end. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Glad to see quite a couple of colleagues from Ukraine, quite a couple of colleagues from Russia. We have a nice discussion uh, all around the world. Some question from the online world. Um, um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, um, you mentioned that, that China blocks their um, their exports and that that increases the crisis. Are there um, is there any hope that governments will um, like come together and um, um, in, be less egoistic and fairly share uh, agricultural inputs <coughs> like fertilizer and insecticides. Yes. So that yeah, this is this is a very good question, and uh, I would like to be optimistic, but I I, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> well, it might be better now, for example, for EU, uh, but we could see it as uh, when the the COVID strikes. So what each in the 
even though we are very tightly together, let's say as the EU, but then every country they separately starting over uh, overpaying uh, the, the the suppliers of the vaccines. Yeah? So and then you could see how uh, chaotic it was. Uh, every country wanted for themselves. That's every country every country at the first what they did. They closed the borders. They started to 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 look where they can buy the vaccines and so on. In terms of fertilizers and also the European Union, I believe, is now more synchronized and they will be able to uh, probably probably uh, work more together. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, if somebody will not want to sell you, it doesn't matter that, that it is a big, uh, big group of people and then you can only do that you will sort of threaten them with something else which you will not be giving to that country and so on and it's creating more tension so um, yeah it's uh, um, hard to say yeah it will depend also um, what sort of approach the EU will will take probably uh, uh, the other regions yeah for example uh, I can't imagine that uh, uh, for example in Africa there would be some coordinated move towards that uh, in Asia it might, but uh, then, yeah, Latin America also, they are, they are also work, working very separately. And now Brazil is, is discussing very closely with Belarus because they need their, their, uh, their supply of fertilizers. Uh, so I think as we speak, they are now in very, very, uh, very uh, big discussion because they just need it because they're also a big agri house of, 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 of the world. Yeah? Yeah, so that maybe isn't this like a great opportunity for BRICS countries to really expand their capabilities because let's just say India apparently avoids all the sanctions because it trades with Russia, so does uh, to some extent Brazil, so therefore this could work for those countries? Uh, I, I would guess so. Well, uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, it was just uh, I think last week happening that uh, for example, uh, uh, Russian oil, yeah, exporting of Russian oil, even though it's it's banned, uh, but uh, I think uh, it was like three fifths of it, even though it's banned. So nothing comes to EU on the on the on, on the sea, yeah. Nothing comes to US and Canada, but the ships were still going somewhere. They were switching on their, their radars, and then they were coming back empty. So probably a lot of it is ending, it has to be ending somewhere within their locations, probably somewhere in Latin America, uh, maybe Africa, depends. Uh, but yeah, there will be countries or individuals who will be benefiting from it. Uh, if it will help break countries as, 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 as like a group, it might, yeah, it's a good call. It might, yeah, depends. depends. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another question from online. This one mm -hmm. from online. Um, if this w is uh, an opportunity to reduce food waste, because uh, we've always learned that half of the food that gets produced is wasted, so if, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we have less. Uh, well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. It it uh, it it might. Uh, in from two, two let's say two perspectives. Yeah, first perspective people will think much more about throwing something out uh, when you are in lack of, of, of uh, food you will not be producing as much and that will uh, appear to all the I hope or I think European as especially uh, European European consumers and then uh, there might be this this aspect that um, we'll be looking more into the uh, sources of organic material which we can transform transform later on into fertilizers and, and so on so uh, also uh, I would uh, uh, so but this is this will be probably like uh, uh, solutions in terms of like households yeah, but it will not necessarily help nationwide because uh, for example to, to uh, collect or start producing uh, very soon um, like digestate from from all the uh, rem remaining food waste from the households, it takes time yeah, to, 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 to build the infrastructure. Yeah, we are now uh, at, at the preparation of of this concept for Prague, but it's more or less at the beginning. Yeah. 
so yeah, it, it, it might in a way lead to, uh, to it, but uh, it will take a longer, longer perspective. But for sure, people will be wasting less. Uh, just, uh, just checking the reports from, uh, from one of my courses where people are making food waste diaries. And this year, even the, the, the food, waste, food waste creation there was much lower than in previous years. Uh, except except Ginny, she last year she had almost zero, but that's a, a zero waste exception. Uh, yes, hi. Okay. So, uh, as you say, the numbers of uh, Ukrainian refugees in Europe, that, that would be uh, 3 million, 1.4 or 1.5, which is a huge amount, which is that the, the most. Uh, Numbers of refugees since the uh, Second World War. What do you think the, the effect of these refugees on the European continent? Um, well, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would guess, or I would say, it it might be very positive. Well, on the continent now, I will talk more about Czech Republic, yeah, where it can have a lot of positive connotations because. Uh, in Czech Republic, we have the lowest unemployment rate in Europe, uh, in EU. So there is a lot of jobs, there is a lot of possibilities, uh, the market was not moving much, so this can create, um, this can be quite beneficial. Uh, for, for, uh, in terms of, of EU uh, or the European continent, uh, in Czech Republic, and of course it is because we have similar language, similar way of thinking and so on. So I think the assimilation here is just very easy. In some other countries, it's a little bit more chaotic. Uh, I, I was talking with colleagues from Germany. They, they, even though they are very, yeah, they like things in, in order, but as, as they like things in order, they like things in order quite too much. So uh, they are administratively now very much struggling and something what, what here takes uh, one, two or three days. Uh, there it takes one or two months. Um, so the, the integration there is, is much slower. Uh, and uh, for example, I yeah, compare that we have around now less than 400,000 people from Ukraine here. Uh, in Germany, they have a bit more. I think they are around, I don't remember, maybe 800,000 or something like that, or 600. But uh, also in terms of the population, yeah, we have much higher number. Uh, we are 10 million compared to, to, to Germany. So, um, yeah, I would see it can have a lot of uh, positive uh, effects in terms of, of, of the, the market, uh, jobs, uh, the integration. Uh, of course, the big thing is, or, or is the structure of, of the people coming from, from, from Ukraine, yeah? we, who is coming as women, children, mainly quite a big number of children. Yeah? So um, that's also something you need to consider yeah, how to work with it. As, as was said, yeah, when you are coming with two or three children, you cannot spend your day at, at work yeah, unless the, the schools are already working and so on. So in some countries, it's a bit more complicated. Here, I think the assimilation and, and the, the country, the Czech country was very flexible and in a nice, nice way. Yeah. There will be, of course, issues, but uh, also uh, I think all the people from Ukraine, they are thinking about it as, a, as a, like a short term solution. And once the Ukraine will win the war, they will be happy to, to come back. Some of them will stay and uh, people in Europe will be, I think, happy that they stay. Yeah. Yeah, but that goes more into like outside of my field. Yeah, it's just I'm talking. It's, uh, it, uh, it's more for some socio sociologist question, I think. Uh, any more questions? No, I went a bit over the time. It's all right. Uh, all right. So thank you very much. Okay. And lastly, I will ask um, Professor Jan Barut to come on up. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, I guess yeah.
yeah, we will also post the uh, the final presentation online so that you guys can definitely take a look at the links here. Here you are. Short introduction. So, <coughs> Professor Jan Banos um, is the Vice Dean for Science and Research and Doctoral Studies here at the faculty. And he's the former Dean of the faculty as well. And research focuses on food security and is quite supportive of a lot of projects and partnerships in developing countries. So, Thank yeah. you very much Thank for you. the introduction. Uh, yes, so when I've been asked and I discussed the topic with uh, Barbara there, so she asked me if I can um, bring some uh, presentation with solutions, how, what, how to deal with the crisis. So I said, thank you very much. This is really easy uh, to find the ideal solutions of this problem because we see still what will happen and how many problems we can expect. So. Uh, we may, we may, I, I try to deal with that, but I have to say that we could divide it to two things. We have short term and long term uh, perspective. From the short term, I think definitely some countries like the Western countries, they will deal with the prices. The price is going to increase. We will, we will, re, uh, we will deal with that. And then there will be some uh, also another problems which will, uh, in countries where actually we have the problems with insufficient or in food insecurity, like uh, being mentioned, uh, for instance, in the Middle East, Lebanon, and uh, especially Yemen, for instance, which are relying on the exports from Ukraine. But I still believe that in some kind of those programs, asked if that have and the food FAO programs, they will try to deal with that problem. Of course, it will need more effort from the rich countries to pay more for the uh, for the development aid projects and etc and we will deal with that in case that uh, within within the short term let's say one one year the question is the long term perspective that's why i concentrate in my lecture on the long term perspective what we can do and i mean uh, we're talking about agriculture and agriculture is a biological process basically so nothing is easy and nothing is short everything needs time and a lot of changes are for maybe uh, decades not 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 years so uh, yeah, this is the share of the exports i will skip that because just i would like to and we have seen the data from the presentation of olga the thing is that the press, the problem is not just Ukraine, but unfortunately also uh, Russia is uh, in that. And both countries are really important and significant, significant exporters of agriculture commodities in, in general. So if we would like to ask what we can do, so maybe the first solution uh, could come from the, from, from, from the perspective that from the agriculture production or from the production perspective. So there are three main means of increasing the agriculture production. So if we have some shortages, we can think about the increase. Okay, but what we can do with that, we can bring new land into agriculture production. We can increase the cropping intensity of existing land, or we can increase the yield of existing agriculture lands. Yeah? Those are the three main three main possibilities what we can what we can do so let's go to look at the first so if how is it with the with the with the new land so this is the board map and we can see the agriculture land and its percentage to, to the total and we can see that the word the world is really diversified in, 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 in this perspective there are some countries in the blue dark uh, uh, color where they have more than 50% of their total land is now used in agriculture. On the other hand, there are some countries uh, where we use uh, less agricultural land, uh, less percentage. Yeah? So, uh, of course, that some of the land could be used, but there are still some limitations because, for instance, you can see that in Canada, there is a still uh, large reserves, but the question is, is if all this land is available for agriculture? Definitely no, because there are forests, a lot of land is not, uh, not suitable for agriculture purposes. So 
the inter in, interesting thing that we have to focus on the global production. So if we, if we look, consider the whole land at, at, at the Earth's surface, we have 29%. Yeah. From that, 71 or 70% is habitable land. Yeah. And 50% and of that habitable is agriculture. And now it is interesting, when we look at the agriculture, 77% of that land is used for livestock, which means meat and dairy production, and 23% for crop. But what is interesting is, if you look how it is going to be uh, presented in the global calorie supplies, we see that the, those 23% covering 82% in our uh, calorie intakes. Yeah? So the minority of the land is used for the major calorie, calorific intake uh, of the human beings on the planet. Yeah? And the same is the global protein supply. The major proteins come from the plant production, not from the meat, meat production. And this is also important to know that and when we're talking that about the problems that we don't have enough grains, we should also to look what we are doing with that grains. And 30% of the grains which are produced worldwide are used as a feeder for the animals to produce meat, of course. So it, may, it needs some kind of habit changes. So we have to think about our diet and it's a comprehensive change, but we just keep in our mind that still there are resources on the, on the planet. Yeah. It could be clearly seen at this figure, which I like. Yeah. So here we have the calories, and here we have from field to four what happens with those calories. This was published in one nature journal. So we start in here. We have the edible crop harvest. Then we, with the post-harvest processing, we lost around 600 calories. Now, you can imagine, if we are going to produce meat, we will lose another 1,700 because we are using this as feeder for animals. And then we are processing and we're producing meat. When we're producing meat or dairy product, we have 500 plus, and then another losses and waste in distribution to households, which is another 800 minus. So this is the final amount of calories which we have in, the, in case that we are going to eat meat, for instance. If we will rely on plant products, we can use this amount of calories from the beginning. So we, clearly, at this figure, you can see the big disproportion between the calories, uh, uh, the using of the calories, if we will uh, rely on the uh, vegetarian diet or meat diet. Yeah? So uh, I don't want to promote the, to be all of us to be vegans or vegetarians, but we have to think about that and we have to see that not all food which is produced on the planet are used just for direct consumption. And if we would like to look at the change in cereal production, because the cereals are important now with relation to the crisis in Ukraine, we can see that the cereal production on the world is still increasing because it's together with the population. What's interesting is that the world general work data shows that we don't use more land, which basically means that the intensity of the agriculture from 60s is rising up. So here we have the, uh, this is the world average, but different data we can see in, for instance, in Africa, in sub-Saharan regions. The problem here is that the population go with the cereal production as well, but the production is below the population, uh, uh, population growth. Uh, on the other hand, here we have still the, 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 the production is higher than, 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 the, than the population. And still we can see that more and more uh, uh, land is used. So the question is, if we would like to increase the production, if really we still have enough resources, yeah? And on this figure, we can see the limit. So those are the 
wheat, I, I concentrate on wheat and corn as two major products, comes from Ukraine and Russia as well, basically. And here we have the yields. So the blue dart are yields over eight tons. And we know that the maximum what, what we can expect from wheat is around 12 tons. Yeah, so that's the really the top. So based on this map, we can see that still there are a lot of areas where we can increase the yield. That's possible. But surprisingly, even in some Saharan countries, some yields are now quite high in between two to four, where the average in this yield worldwide is around 3.5 somewhere. Yeah? So basically, we still have some reserve, but not in all, all, all part of the world. So there is a margin to increase the production, but not such high. And this could be seen clearly on this map. Yeah? This map shows the gaps, how much the countries can produce and how much, how much they use. So we have extreme countries like here, for instance, in Peru, in Latin America, where the gap is from five to six tons. So they have the capacity to have even more higher production than they produce actually. And a lot of countries are in the this part with the one to two tons where we cannot produce, we cannot produce more. So, but the reserves are there, but uh, with, with, with this, with this, with this uh, range, which is shown on, on the map. And similar issues could be seen in case of maize production. So this is the average maize production. And still we see that uh, the majority, uh, the best production of maize is always in New Zealand, the New Zealand is a world leading country in wheat and, and, and also as well in, 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 in corn. And they have around, I guess, 15 tons per hectare or something like that. So between 10 to 15 are the highest productions of, of corn. So we can see definitely that in Africa, there is a still place to increase significantly the, the yield production. And by the way, the corn is one of the most problematic aspects which have been mentioned by Olga and others, because Ukraine and United States are only two countries which exporting the corn. No any other country exporting the corn, and corn is an important part uh, to produce the feed for animals. Yeah. So we have seen that China relying a lot. So which basically we can expect that China in the future, near future, have to rise up the prices of pork meat definitely because that is the material which is, I mean, that the corn is used for to produce the feeder for, for the animals. So we have the margins here, and here again, we have the reserves, yeah? Those are the gaps in maize or crop uh, corn production between the actual, actual yields and what's possible. And we see that in Africa, we have some places, especially here and Nigeria, for instance, up to eight tons to increase, yeah? Based on what they have and what they could have. Yeah, so there are some there are some measures for increasing the production. Another aspect is showing on those maps, which is interesting because one may say, okay, but the agriculture relying, of course, on on uh, on climatic issues, the weather, and etc. But those pictures here nicely show that in uh, in in areas on the border. So we have in the borders of Kazakhstan and China, and this is satellite picture shows that the agricultural intensity on this part is significantly higher than this part, and both of them are in the same climatic zone. Same Turkey, Syria. In Syria, it's obvious, Syria is dealing with other problems than agriculture now, so, but we can clearly see that the agriculture activity is significantly lower than in the neighbor, neighbor country. Yeah, so we can find a lot of those examples. Where is the question of the intensity and how much we are involved in, in, in agriculture activities? And I mean, low production not necessarily mean bad and problematic climatic conditions. And we have to understand some kind of two basic paradoxes in food security. There is enough food to feed the world. That's clear now in terms of the production. And even in the, with the Ukrainian crisis, we will deal with that in the future. But the problem is that 50% of the farmers which are considered as subsistence farmers, so small scale, are hungry. 
So we have 50% of the small farmers worldwide which cannot produce enough to feed themselves, nor to sell the product produced on the market. So this is the place where we have to work, and this is one of our targets, to move those people from this part of, uh, of, of, let's say, this poverty, under this poverty line. And how to do it is that I believe that the solution comes to something which is known and called agroecological farming. Yeah? Again, one slide which I like. Because we have two extremes in agriculture. Subsistence farming, small families, which, is, which, which can, uh, which can uh, problematically, let's say, uh, feed themselves. And on the other hand, we have something which is known as industrial agriculture. Yeah? And also, Hinek mentioned that we will deal with the problems with nitrogen fertilizers and all of these systems relying on artificial fertilizers. So our future is maybe in parts where it's possible to concentrate on something which is in between. So definitely more mechanization, more modern technologies, even precision farming to move this, this agricultural system to the middle. And here we have to little bit uh, press the, the brake and not to input so much artificial fertilizers to the soil because the problem is that we need a lot of nitrogen or we use a lot of nitrogen in agriculture, but the question is if really we need such, uh, such amounts of, of, of nitrogen in agriculture in general. So of course, those aspects are also uh, could be, could be uh, should be uh, mentioned, and maybe if we will go to something in between, then we uh, can uh, solve the problem. By the way, 60% of the food on the planet is produced on farms less than five hectares. So those guys who have those machines and hundreds of hectares are not those who are the most important. Uh, Another aspect, and this is the second and last, I believe that we can focus on agrobiodiversity. Yeah? Nowadays, we have, there are more than 50,000 edible plants in the world, but just 15 of them provide 90% of the world's food energy intake. Yeah? Rice, corn, wheat. And that's exactly why now we are talking and why we have the lecture. We have the lecture because we're relying on rice, corn, and corn and wheat are in Ukraine and Russia. Yeah. So this is we can we can see the example that one conflict could really affect the whole world. Yeah. We call them staple foods, and those are the major ones. And if you look at the at, at, the, at the at the list, the most important are maize, rice, and wheat. Then we have cassava, soya beans, potatoes, sorghum, sweet potato, yams, and other plantains, for instance. Yeah? But those are three from the figures are leading, and it's obvious. But it is not necessary that we should to rely just on those food, staple food. In this case, I have this example. Do you like this photograph? Yes. Yeah, it is nice, isn't it? It's from Ethiopia. Yeah, Ethiopia is a great, great country, nice country. But what is interesting on this photograph is the grass here. And this is not normal grass. It is Eragrostis tef. It is a specific cereal. And Ethiopians are quite specific nation, of course, in the middle of Africa or in Africa, but they relying on this cereal. Even we have seen that they need also part of wheat. But their national diet is based on this picture here. Do you know what is it? This is not the picture from the moon. <laughs> this is injera. Yeah? Injera, which is the typical staple food in Ethiopia. Injera is, you can imagine, it's, one may say it's bread. But injera is something which looks like pancake. And it's prepared like a pancake but from the dough, fermented dough from the 
grains or from the flour from Aragrosti staff. So it has excellent uh, nutrition properties, much better than the dough from wheat. The problem of Aragrostis is as the, the seeds are very small, so the harvest is a little bit complicated and the price of the Aragros or the theft is a little bit higher than the wheat. But the Ethiopians secure their food supply because they're relying on that. And in general, if you will prepare it like this with the traditional food, vegetables and that, and you drink it with the local Habesha beer, it's excellent dish. Yeah? And you don't need to to, to aware about the shortages from Ukraine. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but uh, this is one of the ways that there are some countries which go different way. And not necessarily all of us should rely just on wheat yeah, and corn and rice. That happens, there are a lot of other cereals. So agrobiodiversity, the advantage of agrobiodiversity is a diversity. So you are not relying on one unique thing, thing, and if this thing is missing, then you are in crisis. So I believe that the biodiversity could help in, in those things and put uh, really to uh, be one of the way how to solve with those such kind of, of problems. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. I believe that the major countries could be self-sufficient in the production, but not immediately. You need a policy for that, and you need kind of strategy. And the question is if this is good or bad way. Those who are main promoting kind of free market, they say, why I'm going to produce if I can buy it cheaper from my neighbor? This is one concept. The second is, no, we have to produce because what if in the neighbor country the war happens and the market uh, channels are going to be so for some reason destroyed. Russia is a big country and in, in case of Russia, I don't believe that they will have in the future big problems with that. Yeah? I mean, uh, to, to produce enough even, they are going to be a little bit isolated and I still believe that uh, with some part of the world, they will never be isolated as we are isolating Russia now. So they will deal with some problems, definitely. But I think the major problems will be not just the agriculture. Definitely, there will be that they are dealing with other economical, um, uh, 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 let's say, restrictions. And those will affect also the agriculture, yeah, because the, the, the uh, agriculture is business as any other, of course, is more relying on on uh, on natural aspects but uh, anyway from this point of view i'm optimistic i think this even this conflict is really horrible i believe that it will end and the it will be somehow recovered the problem of russia is not agriculture in russia the problem is uh with a society like about it's how i mean about and are, those are the political issues, yeah, more or less. And what, how the people thinking and uh, how they are too much influenced by the general propaganda. And uh, agriculture is something which is uh, behind that, but uh, Russia is a country which could survive in, 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 those, in those problems. Of course, they have some specific system, 
which is really relying on industrial agriculture, and that's the another story. If the industrial agriculture is the future or no. I'm with that group saying that no. You will have a lot of colleagues at the university who said, industrial agriculture is our future. More and more fertilizers to soil, and more and more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, mechanization and etc. Mechanization is not a big problem. The machinery is, is good, but we have to. We are in the time, and that's the another aspect of this war. We forgot the environmental issues, yeah? and maybe we are now have the lecture about uh, Ukrainian crisis. But next year, or after two three years, we will have the, another lecture that something strong will happen with the environment. And that's the really, that's the problem, yeah? So uh, that will be something where to find the solutions is significantly uh, or much more problematic. We have another question yeah. from online. Um, how can governments catalyze the push towards diversified agroecological farming? <clears throat> And for instance, one program is known as <coughs> organic farming. Yeah, because organic farming is basically agroecological aspect of farming. <coughs> Just it is certified. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the possibilities. Though there are some kind of instruments you can support uh, the, the, the diversity. You can support the farmers, small scale farmers. I mean, in Czech Republic, by now now we have a big discussion about how the subsidies are going to be redistributed. Yeah? Because the general aspect of the subsidy distribution in European Union is that by the subsidy, we, we would like to support the small farmers, family farmers. But unfortunately, in Czech Republic, the farm system is a little bit different and completely different as other Europe. Because in Europe, the, the average area of the farm is around 15 hectares. In Czech Republic, it's 130 or 150. Yeah, it has some historical consequences why it is, but I mean, if you have here farmers who has 3000 hectares and they receiving the same subsidy, the same amount as a farmer who has 20 hectares, it is logical that it is not possible to compare such kind of subsidy. So those farmers who are going to uh, go uh, or do are going to uh, uh, accept the way of, agri of those agroecological aspects, they could be somehow promoted. And that, by the way, is what in the Green Deal is. Yeah? So that's the, the Green Deal want also to support. Yeah? And all this program from farm to fork is about supporting the local producers, supporting the uh, local production and local markets. Yeah. Something. So, well, it was really nice, especially like the percentages when you when you show like the amount of corn and, and wheat that is consumed worldwide. My question is more focused. For example, back home in Colombia, we eat a lot of plantain, a lot of cassava. Yeah. And you said you gave the example of Ethiopia, where they're using different uh, products to to supply the the, the this food into. So how how would you let's say break that barrier and bring new products or like how to say like to improve the production of different uh, foods such as green banana, plantain, or cassava because the numbers were quite low. So how to make people want this product and how to break that barrier? So for example, we can eventually stop relying or like reduce the consumption of wheat. Or no idea. <laughs> I mean, it is really difficult issue. I mean, of course, we have different agroecological zones. So it is difficult to imagine because Ethiopia is a country which is in, in the major country is in the highlands. So in Ethiopia, it's difficult to imagine that they are going to grow large amount of plantains. Yeah? That's why, for instance, if you go to the uh, to the uh, Amazon in Latin America, it's the ideal environment. On the other hand, in Amazon, definitely you are not able to grow wheat, yeah, because it is the wheat is not could resist in the humid tropics. Yeah. So basically, that's one thing that we have to respect the agroecological zones. But then you have to also go. This is kind of 
promotion, advertisement, awareness. I have one example, also I'm using that frequently, in Peru. Years ago, we conducted the project, and uh, before our project, there were one US project, which start to implement uh, the plantation of bananas. Yeah? Because in, in some region near Pucallpa, they, uh, there were problems that the local bananas have been somehow affected by, the, uh, by some uh, specific uh, uh, fungi. So uh, it was this, uh, this uh, uh, plantations being destroyed. And they found one variety resistant in Cuba. And then transformed this variety to, uh, to Peru, start to grow them. Yeah? And this variety was resistant. The yields were quite nice. And one may say banana like banana, but the locals, they don't like to eat it. Yeah? So, and they, they start to aggressively to promote. So if you would like to participate in the project, they said, OK, there's a deal with the farmers. We will give you the plantations for free hour from Cuba, and you will cut off all of yours, original, which cannot resist this, uh, this kind of disease. Mm -hmm. So they did the deal, but finally, when they produced the banana, they seen that they could not to sell, uh, so, uh, sell the, the, produ the produce on the market. So just I would like to demonstrate that, I mean, the, the habits of the consumers and the human beings is very sensitive. And you can see in your own uh, lifestyle that's from time to time, it's for you or for all of us, even me, it's very difficult to change something. Yeah? So it is possible, but it is something like needs a lot of promotion and to go back to start to look at the neglected crops and uh, there are plenty of them as we have seen. But it's really not easy way like this, definitely no. And I said that I will not bring easy solutions. <laughs> because they doesn't exist in agriculture. Any last questions for the professor? Hey, I would like to go question. I see you have a DMG, a different solution, and you have definitely the best solution, but I have a question on your second solution when you talk about the intensity. So when we talk about the intensity, uh, how do we deal with uh, the quality or how do we still maintain the standard of the crops so while, while we are increasing the uh, production? Uh, how do you consider this case? That is the, that's the question, yeah. So uh, intensity, that, that now in, in, in agriculture, that's also discussion. What's more intensive? Is it intensive when I have 100 hectares and on each hectare I'm putting 300 or 50 kgs of NPK? Or if I have two hectares where I have the animals and I have also partly the, the grains and mixture of the agriculture uh, produce? Yeah. So, of course, that's always difficult. So, I mean, if you would like to increase the production significantly, it will affect the quality of the of the of the produce. Uh, one way, if we would like, we don't want to rely on artificial fertilizers, which have been mentioned, and not just because of Ukrainian crisis. The artificial fertilizers are going to be problem in the future, especially for instance, with, uh, phosphorus, which is natural product. Yeah. So basically, uh, maybe. Genetics could help. Yeah, we can have new varieties with higher yields from time to time. There is also a huge discussion about GMOs and others, but this is not actually the GMO. Yeah, still we increasing. As I showed on one of, of our slides, that the production in agriculture worldwide in, increased significantly, but it is not correspondent, it not corresponds to such a large increase of agriculture area which is quite positive news yeah that we are able we have been able from and because of the programs like the green revolution and others we have been able to increase significantly the production but still almost the we increase the land of course but not at the same level as we increase the the production of course now the question is that you have to look at the quality as well and that's for instance again the story which you can see in 
organic farming. Yeah? When you buy the bread, organic bread, you pay double price. The question is if it's acceptable or no. And that is the, uh, the question for the market. Maybe one may say, okay, I can pay for bread this amount, but I want to pay, but it's normal is to pay triple time or 10 times more for the, for the ticket to the cinema. Yeah? And when the ticket to the cinema uh, rise up, nobody discussing, but when the bread is go up, two, three crowns, yeah, it's a catastrophe. So we can maybe in the future think that agriculture commodities will rise up a little bit, of course, yeah. But of course, they have could, must be somehow in balance because they affect the lifestyle. But this is also the huge discussion that we have to look at the future also that what we're eating and the nutrients aspects and all contents of the, of the, of the food. So we can increase the production, but in some limits, of course. That's why I said maybe not industrialized agriculture, but agroecological, which is better of course, then uh, uh, subsistence farming, which is not the way. So we have to find maybe the middle. But this is my perspective, yeah? So you will find also others. I don't want to present that those are the 100% solutions. Those are ideas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I said, short term solutions are that the international organizations like FAO through IFAD program, they have to try to help such kind of countries in danger, in need. Yeah. From the future perspective, of course, first is to look for the political stability. Second, when I have political stability, I can think about good agriculture approach. Yeah. So uh, that was, for instance, the picture in Turkey and Syria on the border. Yeah. In the same area. In Turkey, green areas producing a lot. In Syria, nothing, obviously, because they have another conflict. Yeah. And same thing in those countries, it, I, it, <laughs> Lebanon was one of the most developed countries in the region years ago, isn't it? So we cannot say that Lebanon has no any possibility to solve the problem. It has. But the people has to have the chance to do it. But this is also a long-term aspect. Yeah. I think you are almost hungry, guys, isn't it? So <laughs> you look pretty hungry. Let, yeah, let's to stop it here. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. again. Yeah, thank you. I've got a nice bright slide to wake you up. Uh, right. So thank you again for your attention. Um, right here is a QR code with the official Chesedu donation portal. Um, if you don't trust the QR code, that's the, uh, the URL at the bottom there. And um, essentially, it goes directly to the refugees who have fled from the war and to buy, firstly, the food and hygiene packages that come when they arrive and to equip the children's center here at the school uh, for admission to cultural facilities and to help integrate into life here. So that's what donation does. And um, then also remember, if you're not able to do it this way, there's many ways you can help in terms of volunteering, especially at the school. Um, and donation centers with household items. I know that they're definitely looking for right now, sports equipment, uh, to name a few. So thank you to everybody who's already helped out and who continues to do so. Thank you to the presenters today. It was wonderful to hear um, your insight into this very um, difficult topic, uh, but something that affects us all. So thank you again. And we will move over to the cafe room for a little snack and some drink. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned for our future events.